he does props. I look at props. I do. I, I try making props and I and I lecture about the things and I BS a lot, but Gary, I can't BS because Gary's here. Neil Coleman. Neil Coleman. Um, how many of you took any type of mathematics, uh, um, geometry, uh, trigonometry in school? Uh, you loved it, didn't you? Yeah, I forgot. Today's lecture is on trigonometric at, uh, application to wood air screw uh, manufacture for all you cheap bastards. <laughs> so if I offend you, too bad. I, I can't offend somebody, they just have to take offense. Um, I started making propellers back at the time when I became a real cheap bastard because I had uh, had too many opportunities uh, to buy propellers from Sturba props or uh, Colby <coughs> props. Uh, this is my first flight. I actually, in this particular airplane right there, the one in the middle, uh, became a German ace. I brought down five French Newports. <laughs> I never did get a thing. Before we retired these airplanes, we actually uh, were on the cover of nine different aviation magazines. The first one was in 96, uh, 98. We were the cover of uh, people for uh, the uh, Copper State Fly-In when it was held out at uh, um, Gateway. Um, one day we were out doing a photo shoot uh, and uh, had a lot of experience uh, then. This particular cover was uh, Custom Planes um, in August of 2001. Then we know what happened in September of 2001. Then in October, on that same uh, photo shoot, they took this picture and we were on the back cover of Custom Planes in tribute to the veterans. Um, on, that same, on that same photo shoot, I had the opportunity to have an engine out uh, just north of Casa Grande and oh. took a picture just before a touchdown on the freeway. Oh. And I became the next month <laughs> picture of the month. <laughs> yes, it, yes, it, yes, it was exciting. You know, no, I didn't break anything except the cop tried to that I broke the law. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was kind of exciting. And uh, consequently, you know, one of my, my, my very first takeoff was this was my first landing. Uh, but um, I had a little bit of experience doing woodwork, uh, so I figured I could make a propeller. It's a little bit different to make this medallion uh, in the uh, entryway of my home. <coughs> this is my desk uh, that I made in my home. A little bit different to do propellers than it is to do this type of woodwork with marquetry or, or inlay, uh, but um, I figured if I can do this, I can do a propeller. Uh, any of you that have ever had the experience or the need uh, to buy a propeller from Sturba, from uh, uh, Gary, from uh, uh, Culver, uh, back back when I had this type of a problem, a propeller, 60 inch long. Uh, with a 26-inch pitch, which was perfect for our new ports with the Volkswagen engines. The prop uh, cost was about $265. Today, that same prop is around $485. You know, I was just hearing Gary say uh, his uh, started at $1,300 or something like that. Hell of a lot cheaper to make your own. <coughs> but uh, there are a bunch of things that are needed to be able to make propellers. Um, I actually made a, a uh, club uh, for when we were doing some experimentation on one of the new ports when we put a uh, prop speed reduction you know, PSRU on Billy Walker's uh, airplane. I made a, a propeller, laminated it up the way that it should be out of uh, alder wood, too soft, and by the time he had it up to full, full uh, speed, <laughs> it <laughs> flew apart and pieces went from hell to breakfast. Uh, but uh, always start with a good hardwood. What hardwood do you use? Generally speaking, when you're looking at Culver or, or Resturba, they usually use maple. Uh, hard maple, there are two types of maple, hard, hard maple and soft maple. I always use used hard maple, but I like uh, character uh, in a propeller, so I started using uh, walnut uh, and uh, among others. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more later on. But it's nice to have the tools to be able to do what is necessary to be able to create uh, something along the line of, of uh, surface planer, table saw, bandsaw. They're all really, uh, really needed uh, 
uh, a prop duplicator, and I'll show you a couple of examples of prop duplicators. Gary has one similar to the one that I use. Um, <coughs> and it tends to be um, a little bit smarter than the average person when you're using some tools. You know what this is? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Democrat woodworker ordering five beers. <laughs> Um, and uh, if you're going to make your own design, which I have an example here and one that I made, uh, start with softwoods. It's a whole lot easier to make a pattern to create your own propeller if you're carving softwoods because you make your propeller from a single blade, then you know that they're both, both ends of the uh, two, two bladed prop is going to be, uh, they're, all, they're both going to be the same. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Um, <coughs> surface planer, joiner, table saw, band saw, lots of types of sanders to be able to accomplish what you need to do to be able to finish a thing because once you're, you're done uh, uh, making your blank, cutting your blank uh, with a prop, a prop duplicator, uh, it's really rough and you have to, to uh, do a lot of sanding. So I have numerous belt sanders, uh, uh, finish sanders, <coughs> uh, drum sander, uh, also, it's nice to have a, uh, a contour um, uh, device to be able to measure what uh, the <coughs> angle is, uh, or the, uh, the shape of the airfoil on the front of the, uh, the prop, that's what that is. Then you make yourself lots of uh, different profiles uh, for the different uh, parts along the uh, prop. Arlo, uh, um, what's your last name? Arlo. Watkins. This is a prop that he had on his headwind that has lots of cracks in the, in the uh, hub. He wanted to have uh, a new prop made. I told him I wanted to make him a new prop. So I, this is a duplication of his original prop using maple and walnut on the outside and a type of wood called bloodwood. <coughs> just, for, just to make it pretty. Um, but it's easy to, to uh, take a previously uh, manufactured propeller made by another company and duplicate it and, and create what it is that you have had but make it a little bit better than what the original is. But it's nice to have the profilers uh, to be able to measure what the uh, profile is at any particular station from the uh, center of the, uh, the prop and uh, always mark the things so where they go. Um, if you're going to make your own design, you need to have a back saw and a uh, digital level uh, and lots of clamps. There's a line that says uh, a woodworker never has enough clamps. The other day I was working on a uh, dining room table that I'm making for my wife and I used every single <coughs> clamp that's there. Wished I had more, but you never have too many. I'm a person that likes using T88. I've used T88 for a long time. Uh, don't even think about putting anything together with uh, any uh, source at all or any hide glue or uh, whatever it is that I used a long time ago. Uh, um, Elmer's glue, it just won't hold up. Uh, even tight bond, there are different uh, degrees of holdness, if you will, of, uh, of uh, a tight bond, but uh, always use a, uh, an epoxy. Uh, a gallon kit of a T88 runs you about 110 bucks. <coughs> and you might use a third of a gallon of uh, stuff depending upon uh, how many how many layers you decide to uh, glue up. <coughs> Sturba and uh, uh, Culver make three layers thick of the uh, uh, propeller for a Volkswagen engine. And it's just because of the fact that they're three quarters of an inch thick, so you end up with a <coughs> three and a quarter inch thick uh, propeller. It's <coughs> the cheapest way to go about making a propeller. They always make theirs on uh, the only ones that I've ever seen are in maple. Uh, this is two layers of walnut to one layer of maple. maple quarters of an inch. After uh, seeing different stresses that a propeller is put under uh, when, it, when it's in use, you find that the, the more layers that you have, the better. I've done as many as 11. How many is this? One, two, three, four, seven, <coughs> four, seven, seven layers there. Uh, at the same thickness uh, of the propeller as this, uh, this three-layer thing uh, from Excuse me, that's four layers. I lied. Um, but anyway, hold everything together with your uh, epoxy. Take your time uh, to uh, um, wait for it to dry. Uh, at least 24 hours. I like to go 48 hours. Um, always plan.
explain your idea along the uh, or your, your prop along the idea that you're going to uh, have 100% uh, efficiency and then hope to get 70, uh, which is <coughs> a normal situation. All these things pitch as the distance of the propeller moves forward with every rotation. And the same thing goes with the airplane. As long as it stays attached to the propeller, it's going to move forward the same, the same uh, uh, distance. Speed is the antis anticipated forward movement of an airplane. And that particular aspect is important to remember when you are planning the propeller that you have or that you're going to make. Um, <coughs> the four main stresses that propellers are under, uh, wood propellers specifically, there are some like uh, metal propellers are under a, a have a potential for, for uh, having problems associated with vibration uh, uh, in the uh, wood absorbs the vibration a little bit better but you do everything you can to make it so that it's as balanced as possible naturally uh, before you uh, fly the thing. Uh, but, uh, vibration isn't so much a big aspect uh, with wood propellers but uh, the bending forces when the thing is turning it wants to break the, break the cantilever ends of the thing off of the hub, uh, the uh, centrifugal forces forcing everything outwards. And I've, I've always wondered why it is that any propeller maker would, and you can see it, uh, at least on this side, lamination on this particular layer where this is one piece of wood and this is another piece of wood. I don't, uh, I don't ever do that. I use really multiple lengths when I make my prop. How do you do yours? Do you do the same thing or do you lamination? Uh, and then twisting stress. Twisting uh, stresses in propellers based on the fact that most uh, propellers have a certain amount of thrust from the trailing edge of the of the propeller uh, that makes it so that it potentially wants to split right down the middle of the of the of, of the uh, thing. If, the, if you look at the, the the force of the propeller being down through the middle, it's not under that much stress. But when you look the, at the idea uh, of what why they came up with uh, scimitar, full scimitar props, that puts a lot of stress on the airplane. So you need to have a lot of layers. This is a prop that I have made for Arlo, where I designed the thing myself. And in the, even in the thinner areas, back here, I have a minimum of three layers of wood. I think that is nine, nine layers or 11 layers, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, uh, following the a line straight through the center axis of the uh, propeller, along this trailing edge to this trailing edge, the, uh, the, uh, that straight line ends up about right here. So all of this material out here is behind the point of thrust on that thing so that it wants to bend around, which is the reason for a single tar prop in the first place, to be able to, when you give power and you're not moving very fast, it flattens itself out, creating it uh, uh, as a more of a climb prop. And then when you're up on the step and you're flying, it bends itself back to the original shape and now it becomes a cruise prop. That's why it's scimitar. And I don't know how much this works because it is kind of thing that it works well, doesn't it? It's like it. I'll uh, show you a video of him flying <coughs> his propeller on. And then, <coughs> it, it, um, I find this to be the case, especially in my Stearman and my Waco, when I turn a corner on the ground, the airplane is just really struggling to get around. That's the uh, fourth thing, twisting and bending, turning circular flight or circular taxi. <laughs> Never, ever exceed a uh, rotational speed of 900 feet per second on a propeller. Uh, once you reach, they've actually found that once you're above about eight, 750 to 800 uh, feet per second, you're actually not gaining any benefit, and above a thousand feet, you're a thousand feet per uh, second, you're actually losing about 10% per 100 uh, RPMs. So plan it at 900 feet per second. How do you figure that one? In my new ports, our new ports, um, we trusted Sturba and Culver in their uh, figures on length and uh, pitch. Uh, to be the most efficient for a direct drive Volkswagen engine. Is yours direct drive? 60 inch, 28, uh, 26 inch pitch. The direct drive is 3,200 uh, RPMs. Um, 60 inch pitch, 60 inch pitch, uh, high D uh, times the RPMs. What's that? You said 60 inch pitch, 60 inch diameter. 60 inch diameter. 26 inch pitch. 
but if you uh, look at the rotational speed, it's pi d. Um, and on that particular uh, um, propeller, I had 837 feet per second. You don't really want to exceed that too much. The bad thing is that the Volkswagen engine starts to, uh, and I'm going to use the Volkswagen, my, my Newport, as an example of uh, how to design things and why you want to uh, go particular things. Um, the uh, 3200 RPMs was just about the low end of the uh, power range of a Volkswagen engine. Uh, so, you know, we were able to fly, and we actually cruised at about 75-ish miles an hour with this particular propeller. But we got discussing the whole idea of creating something to make it so that uh, the engines were winding up a little bit higher, uh, which would make it so that we'd have to have <coughs> a proper <coughs> reduction unit uh, to be able to, to uh, not exceed 900 feet per second. And the on Billy's, so, so there we have that propeller that I made, uh, that's, that's one of the originals. Uh, to have a little bit faster in airplane with, uh, with more torque, uh, was going to require a longer propeller and a steeper pitch. So if you solve for speed, which was anticipated, if you, if you say, okay, I think my air engine on my airplane is going to be able to produce uh, 100 miles an hour. Uh, what kind of speed, what kind of propeller length and pitch do I need to have to be able to create this thing? Speed in miles per hour equals the pitch times the RPMs. Pitch the distance that the thing moves forward for every RPM. Uh, so anyway, based on on uh, the speed of, of the 3200 RPM Volkswagen, we get 70 miles per hour, which was sort of what it is that we got. Um, but then we looked at the idea of putting the prop speed reduction unit on Billy Walker's airplane. We put it on. We made it. Uh, we he got a two two to one gear reduction unit. Uh, uh, that we put on uh, his engine, was able, we were able to get the engine up to 4,000 RPMs with a 2,000 RPM um, uh, prop speed, which worked out to be about a 78-inch propeller. That's what I made for Billy, created a, 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 a blank, and I didn't want to go the whole thing of doing too many things more than just a longer prop. So here's what we ended with, here's what that same airplane started with. diameter at 2,000 RPMs, that prop, spit prop was only turning at 680 RPMs, which is okay. You want to be below 900. Um, but then going with the thing pitch times the RPM equals the speed of the airplane, solving for pitch, we'll, we'll let you get your iPhones out in a little while to be able to figure these things. <laughs> With an anticipated uh, 100 mile an hour airspeed, 2,000 RPMs, uh, solving four inches, made it a 53 inch pitch. That's what that propeller is. The numbers worked out. Even though Billy only got about 90 miles an hour, the, the best that we, we could ever do is about 90 to 100 if we were going straight down with our, our 60, 26, 26. But Billy was able to climb like a homesick angel <laughs> with that prop and the PSRU. Um, it ended up actually, we didn't get the RPMs that we wanted to have with a 58 inch pitch, so I shortened this one an inch on each end, got a 56 inch um, uh, length with a, a 53 inch pitch, and he cruised at 90 to 100. And it worked. <coughs> when Arlo bought his headwind, Arlo Watkins bought his headwind that had this one, like I say, that had cracks in the hub, and I made him a brand new uh, propeller. That's that. That's his headwind Volkswagen engine, uh, with the same exact propeller as what it came with. But I'd always wanted to make a scimitar prop, so I sat down and figured what it was that I needed to be able to do to be able to make this full scimitar prop, just because it's sexy. Um, but there's the beginning of the the uh, prop. Final thing uh, after balancing, uh, but I started uh, with the scimitar, thinking, okay, 
That's about the shape that I want it to have, more or less. So I just cut that out and started making a blank, and we've got this blank out of pine, just pine lying around my place, and started carving. Took the profiles uh, from Arlo's original prop and um, <coughs> uh, created the, uh, the airfoil shape on the front. To be able to get the appropriate uh, angle or blade angle on the different points along this scimitar prop, I wanted to keep it basically the same pitch and the same diameter. So that even though that looks a whole lot beefier, it's the same pitch and same length as his original one has been again. Prop number one is Arlo called. Um, but the blade angle is the important thing when it comes down to what's the pitch that needs to be at the different points along the, <coughs> along the blade. And that uh, the pitch divided by the circumference is the arc tangent. What the hell is arc tangent? <laughs> Bring out your iPhones out. <laughs> Come on, get your iPhones out. Turn up the calculator. Oh. All right, never mind. <laughs> Um, in this example, 53 inch pitch, 248 inch at the at the, the full length, 50 uh, the 66 it was 66 wasn't it? Mm -hmm. 66 inch uh, diameter. <coughs> Wait, this one was Billy's uh, uh, propeller. Uh, you figure the the angle that you need to cut each uh, station on that. Uh, that blank. Uh, start cutting into the thing until you get the angle that you need, uh, and then start chipping out, start sanding, and you end up with a blank that you can use as a pattern to be able to create um, the, uh, the real propeller. Blade angle, uh, again, it's pitch divided by circumference. At particular points, you <coughs> the pitch divided by that circumference gives you a number on this on this one at, uh, at the full length, 0.21633, uh, three, three. punch that into your iPhone, you come out with a 12.2 degree pitch angle. That's at the tip of the prop. Down closer, <coughs> at halfway along, it's a 23.39 uh, pitch angle for the same pitch uh, closer in uh, diameter. Um, <coughs> now you look at a comparison between the original idea what it is that I finally ended up with with this thing. Took that, used it as a, a pattern for, there's, there's the drawing for uh, putting the brass leading edge on, um, and created the propeller. Now, people have asked me, how do you figure out what the shape is on the airfoil side of the propeller? Way back when they first started creating airplanes and propellers, they made almost everything in uh, the shape of a Clark Y. You've all heard of a Clark Y airfoil, basically it, because it's easy to, to make. It's flat on the bottom and has this airfoil uh, on the top. But Clark Y has the height of contour between the, the highest point on the airfoil side and the, and the back face of the uh, propeller at 30% the cord length. Um, it's a little bit less safe than what they came up with later on called the Clark Y H. The H has just a little bit up curve on the leading edge and training edge. Other, it's, other than that, it's the same thing with Clark Y. But it, it, it actually uh, increases the incidence of that propeller, uh, makes it a little bit safer. But it doesn't really, it sort of changes the incidence, but not really. Uh, but that's how you determine it, again, based on, and I did it, uh, as, many, as many stations along the original prop used that on uh, when I was doing the uh, blank, that's all corresponded with what it is that I had on uh, on uh, the original prop, and then had it extrapolate out, just kind of make a nice smooth curve from one end to the other. And then there's the blank that I uh, glued up for this uh, scimitar prop using whatever many layers of, uh, of uh, walnut and two layers of, his airplane was blue with an orange stripe, with, two, with an orange stripe down the side. I wanted to have an orange stripe in the propeller, so I used uh, Padouk as an, uh, an African wood. I wish I had put it a little bit toward the, uh, more toward the front, because there's a lot of face of walnut showing before the first layer of orange Padouk. Took 
the bandsaw to it, did the main uh, uh, shape carving, and then started with my prop duplicator. Here's a prop duplicator that you can actually buy uh, if you wanted to, to go out full blast. $3,600. <coughs> it probably doesn't even include the, the uh, router. Definitely doesn't include the table. Or you can make your own prop duplicator. Costs about 100 bucks plus the cost of the router. I started out when I was making propellers for the uh, new force with a one and three quarter inch horse. Now I'm up to a three and a quarter inch horse. Uh, and it reduces the time by maybe 15 minutes <laughs> over what it was before. Um, before we'll see if the, uh, the next one does anyway that was that that one was the, uh, <coughs> the beginning of the carving using the prop duplicator then Arlo was finishing the thing up um, anyway that's what we ended up with after we uh, finally got the carving done uh, let me go back a second uh, as I was showing you the uh, the creation of the um, the blank uh, cutting and chipping out and then doing a little bit of carving. Uh, as a dentist, I learned uh, the importance of not having a high spot or any filling that I put in somebody's tooth. This accomplishes the same, uh, same purpose. When you get done with your main carving, paint it with uh, a, a fast dry primer and then start sanding. Uh, you sand off the high spots first, showing you where all the low spots are because the paint's still there. By the time you finally get down to where it's almost done, then uh, you, you go to a much finer um, uh, grit on your sandpaper and you end up with something that basically is the shape that you want it to, have to be. So that's where we were on the carving of uh, the propeller. When it was finally done, you take a lot of all of your sanders and smooth it up as much as possible. And there's what we had after I just put a clear stain on it. Uh, all the stain. And there's the final product. Hopefully this will work, Charlo. No, it's not gonna work. Anyway, uh, but I just had a video there of uh, it was working. It was working on yours? Disjointed on this pretty presentation, but there it is. That's what. That's the way that I do it. <laughs> it better be an experimental airplane. <laughs> okay. Question. All right, we're done. Go home. Where did those? Who built them? We built. Them. We built them over a period of uh, three years. Uh, all five of them. We had determined that we were going to build them all together and, and not have our own propeller, uh, our own airplane until the very end. So by the time we had them essentially covered and painted and together, not including instruments, not including uh, engines, then we got together and we had a drawing, had a, a drawing with our, our five names in in uh, one uh, hat and the number of the airplane in another hat. We pulled them out, put them together, and there it was. By the time we were done, the difference in weight Five airplanes was, was one and a quarter pounds between the heaviest and the lightest. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then we put our own engines on. And uh, by the time we were done, we had these uh, airplanes that uh, ended up costing us an average for everything about forty-five hundred dollars. Wow. Uh, <coughs> two years. I spent 
It's fun to make a prop, especially when you can get into using things other than ugly, boring maple. Uh, as long as it's a hard wood, uh, it's uh, nice to have, and especially if you're using the propeller as the uh, flywheel of the engine. This, uh, this propeller weighs about a pound more than this propeller, and it's all because of the weight of that bloodwood, those two layers of bloodwood in there. Um, maple uh, weighs they determine the, well, weight of a wood is, has no major reflection on its strength as a wood in a propeller, but maple weighs about 26 to 28 pounds per cubic foot, whereas blood wood weighs 60 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, is it better? Mm, who knows? 
hard to say. It's hard. Uh, it's hard to know if this is going to come out uh, on laminate. There's some woods that are very, very oily, like any type of. Uh, I'd love to be able to make one out of uh, of um, rosewood. A rosewood is very oily, and over time, I think even an epoxy is going to release off uh, of the rosewood, even with its heaviness. Yes. Are the laminates even when you do multi laminates like as many as 21, like the, like the warranty crops? Do they always laminate them all together? Or do you sometimes do sections? Because it, it, it's, it's going to start to kick off by the time you get to the last. It depends on how fast you do it. I've seen uh, uh, blues that they spray on and they're able to do it really, really quickly. I, um, I've had individuals tell me they like uh, West Systems epoxies because they come with a, a base and three different catalysts, uh, slow, medium, and fast. Uh, I, I've had, ex I've never used West Systems, so I don't want to have to be burdened with figuring out, okay, the temperature is 78 degrees in here today, I better use the slow set or the medium set or whatever. T88, I don't know how long it takes me to, to uh, do a, a layup uh, and uh, how long I've got for open time, and uh, so I don't even think about, uh, is it going to uh, set off before I get the last piece uh, on? And I try to keep the number of laminations to a minimum, yet at the same time, enough to be able to make it so that the strength is there. You know, everybody knows that a solid piece of whatever piece of wood is a whole lot less strong than a, a piece of plywood made of uh, the same stuff. And the more laminations that you have, the better the strength. You look at a 16th inch piece of uh, aviation uh, plywood <coughs> used in skins of a, of a wooden airplane, and you're looking at five layers in that 1 16th of an inch. Uh, it's almost, you know, four layers of blue held held apart by thin pieces of wood. Uh, I've seen some props, I thought it was Warnicky, that made their stuff out of, uh, of, you know, you see a four inch thick prop that has 48 laminations because each layer is 16th of an inch thick. Uh, I think that's kind of uh, going a little bit too far. Huh? Like I say, in the thinness that you get on, to, on the trailing edge of any particular thing, I still have, like I say, three layers here. And that's enough to be able to hold everything together. I would never, ever consider making something like this with only three uh, laminations, three layers of, 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 of maple. So, and, and if you look closely, you notice my laminations aren't all equal in, in uh, thickness. I'll start out with whatever it is that I want to have for, for the main wood, and then I'll take the last things, like the uh, Padoop that I used here, and I'll uh, create its thickness and it through my planer uh, to, to plane it to the thickness that I need to have it to be so that by the time I'm done, it is this thick. And also, one other, one other thing I wanted to point out, don't ever think that you can glue two pieces of wood together after you've sent it through a planer or use a planer on it to make it flat. The sawdust fills up the pores in the wood and it, make, and it interferes with the ability for the, the glue to penetrate into the wood so the, the uh, uh, lamination uh, point is a lot weaker than a cut edge. So always get a good planer, send it through, have a cut edge, and glue it together. Don't plane it. I uh, don't sand it. Don't sand it, okay. Ever. Uh, I, I use a um, welded plastic resin. It, it works beautifully. Does it? I have to heat cure at about 120 degrees, uh, but I've never had a glue failure, and about $2.50 a prop to glue them up. Problem with West System is it, it, uh, it will soften at about 130 degrees, and uh, on a tractor propeller, on a push tractor, a pusher propeller, uh, it'll be landing on it because of the, the heat coming out the engine. So you really don't want to use the West system. Um, the amount of thrust that you get out of a, of a propeller is also based on, um, you know, where the hub of the uh, airplane actually end, uh, the, the propeller actually ends and where the, the potential thrust point that begins, they've uh, done tests and found that 20% of the length of the prop is absolutely useless when it comes to um, ability to push air. Uh, don't tell that to the uh, people that make uh, Curtis Reeds, because Curtis Reeds is the most efficient, and, it, and it's a, a, a one piece of aluminum, <coughs> and it's a blade all the way to the hub. Uh, but, uh, so six inches, don't even worry about the, uh, the angle of uh, Incidents or the angle of the, of the uh, uh, pitch angle uh, at the last uh, six inches from the center, and then go from there. That's why I, I'll always mark the things at different points along the way, and this is what I know I need to have it at 
when I'm making the, uh, the other one, or the, uh, the duplicate. Mike, how do you cut the laminations? You do use a uh, uh, saw and then plane them? My, uh, my band saw, uh, I got specifically, when I was building my house, I had two uh, uh, shutter companies go bankrupt on me after I gave them my deposit, so I decided I was going to make my own. And, and as a gift to me to make my own uh, uh, shutters for my home, I bought myself what is called a resaw, a big band saw with a 12 inch throat. Uh, and then just cut down the middle and then plane them uh, and uh, do whatever, uh, unless I'm going to make something with only, with, uh, with that's only three quarters of an inch thick. But to make uh, things with something like that, I'm not going to take a three quarter inch piece, piece of walnut and plane it down to be three eighths of an inch thick, ultimately. I'm going to cut it in half and then plane it and make it flat. So I split them to, to them with my uh, uh, 12 inch uh, five horse bandsaw with a one and a quarter inch blade, uh, 1.3 teeth per inch, and cuts like butter. What do you finish your props with normally? I found that uh, probably one thing that you don't want to finish anything with, even a table, is lacquer. Because lacquers absorb moisture. And if, uh, if you've ever had a table that's made in China, uh, it's made with uh, uh, you know, Corona enlaced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you place a, a cold drink on the table and it sweats and gets <coughs> moisture underneath that drink and now it uh, goes into the wood and now you have a black drink. That's the nature of uh, lacquer. <coughs> I usually will finish mine with a type of, of uh, varnish, what is called conversion varnish. It's used by um, guitar manufacturers uh, because it's so good. At, um, it, it's shiny, it's strong, it's hard, not overly hard. Um, and uh, it's easy to use. That's the best. Conversion bar, it's about a hundred bucks a, a gallon at uh, the paint store on um, Mesa Drive in Southern. Hmm. Have you got the slides on making guitars too? <laughs> I could. <laughs> 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 yeah, my son got me into making guitars and uh, so we make bass guitars more than anything else. So, yeah. That's where I got into the uh, the whole thing of bloodwood and other exotic woods for uh, doing whatever it is. Uh, I, I use all types of exotic woods. For and that, and that bloodwood just happened to be lying around, and I thought, well, let's put it in the uh, prompt. And Arlo likes it. That's all that matters. Arlo likes it. <laughs> what else? Happy to help anybody that wants to do it once. I'll, I'll help you. I'm not going to do it for you, but I'll help you. <laughs> I have an 800 square foot shop with all the tools that you need to be able to make whatever you want. And if Bob wants to come out up and see my shop one day, and I'm happy to have you guys uh, you know, just get your wood. Uh, one of the better places I've found to buy the woods, uh, you know, there's some that, you know, call me and uh, I'll tell you what not to get. Uh, but one of the best places to get the woods at a less expensive price is timber woodworking up on, uh, 